request CA CP Jain uh, to escort our beloved speaker CA Ismail B Sonawala sir onto the dais and hand over a bouquet of flowers. Thank you. Good afternoon, one and all present here and virtually present. Uh, this is CA Manjunath M. Hallur, Treasurer, Bangalore branch of SISFICI. I have immense pleasure in introducing Ismail B. Sir. CA Ismail B. Sonawala is based out of Mumbai and is a practicing chartered accountant since uh, more than 35 years. He is the proprietor of Messrs. Sonawala and Associates and the managing partner of Messrs. RMI and Associates Chartered Accountants. Since the last 24 years, he has been a regular faculty at various lectures or seminars being organized by various regional councils of the ICAI, its branches and its study circles and has delivered more than 135 lectures all over India on various topics concerning accounting and auditing standards, audits of commercial and cooperative banks, credit societies, etc. He has more than 40 years of audit experience of nationalized banks, private sector banks, and cooperative banks. He has finalized more than 175 bank branch audits of all major nationalized and cooperative banks. Since last six years, he has also been invited to give lectures by various branches of Southern India Regional Council. He has been a regular contributor to WRC's reference manual since its inception more than 18 years ago. He has also contributed articles on various topics in our CA Institute journal, WRC's booklets, as well as other publications. Besides this, he is also very active in social activities since many years. Presently, he is the chairman of Diamond Jubilee Trust, which operates all over India. With this brief introduction, I present before you all our speaker, CA Ismail B. Sonawala, sir. Over to you, sir. Good morning, all my friends, offline and online. Uh, it's really a pleasure to give offline lectures. Um, I did give online lectures, but uh, it was no fun because in front of you, there are no people. And when there are no people, you don't see the reaction. You don't get the encouragement to speak or the, in front of just the screen. Uh, I think after two years, I'm coming back. To, the last one was in your region, Madurai. And I'm coming back now to give uh, offline lectures to the. So thanks to Bangalore. Uh, as soon as I got a phone call, I readily accepted it uh, to give this, uh, deliver this lecture in an offline mode. My material is already in the book. And uh, you can read it because everything that I'm going to say here has been covered there. The only thing that has not been covered there are my stories. And uh, those are not stories taken up from any of the books. Those are stories which I have encountered during my audit career or a long audit career uh, with various banks. Um, to be specific, there are 32 stories. 
but I don't think I'll have the time available to convey all those stories. So as many as I can cover up, I will uh, try to do it. This is a book that has been published by the Institute and it's a very book, very good book being published since many, many years. One thing I would like to say about the previous speaker, Dhananjay, he has been effectively the author of this book. He has been leading the team which has been redrafting or updating this book since the last four or five years as much as I remember. And that is why I, uh, during the break, I said that you have got one of the best speakers on the topic that can be available anywhere in India because he's the one who actually writes the book uh, on that. He is also in the team, uh, which has, there's an online team, uh, which, WI, which ICI will introduce, where you can put up your queries and you'll get an answer in about uh, 24 hours. That is the mandate that is given to us. He is on that team. So if there are issues that are there, you can uh, put it on the, on the mail and uh, hopefully you should be able to get an answer from the ICSA, there's a whole team of uh, people who will be giving the reply, not necessarily Dhananjay will give, but he's one of them. So this booklet, it is very necessary that uh, you download it. You have not to buy it. It is available on the, the ICI website. Go there, download it, read it. The book has been divided into two major sections. One is meant for the central statutory auditors. The other is meant for the branch auditors. From page number 257 onwards, you can uh, read this booklet and it will be very, very useful to you as far as your bank audit is concerned. A word of caution to all those who have been allotted bank audit. How many of you have got already got the bank audit? Can you raise your hands? Very few. Yeah, I know allotments are still going on. Um, there is some bad news from Reserve Bank of India and the bad news is that uh, already in the first two quarters they have detected more than 4,000 frauds amounting to more than 36,000 crores. That has already been detected in the first two quarters. I don't know how many more frauds that will be detected and that will come up. The point is that you have to be vigilant. You have to be vigilant when you go to, for the audit. Now when you have to be vigilant, you have to sit there and do the audit. And when you sit there and when you do the audit, the banker will come and say, please complete the audit fast. Please complete the audit fast. What do you do? Complete the audit fast? Yes or no? If you don't interact, I will not be able to say what, uh, I mean, I'm going to ask you questions and you have to give me the answers. That is why I love offline lectures so much. Are you going to comply with that or you're not going to comply with that? So the, you will be blacklisted from the audit. What will you do? Don't worry. You are not going to get blacklisted. As long as you are sitting there and you're auditing, I'll give you what answers to be given there. All practical answers. Tell them, yes, you want the audit to be completed. I'm sitting here doing the audit. I will complete it in the number of days you tell me to do it. You want a report today evening, I'll give it to you. There's only one small condition. And that small condition is whatever I have not verified, I'm going to put it in the main audit report. If that is acceptable to you, you can take it. Fine. Go ahead. No banker is going to accept it. No banker. So to counter their argument, please complete it by fifth, fifth com complete it by six. If you're sitting or if you don't go to the audit, then that is a different thing. But if you're going to the audit, don't worry about it. There was one incident with one of the banks quite a few years ago, when the normal date was 10th of April. I signed the report on 18th of April with the regional managers sitting in my office pleading me to sign the report. If I get the time, I'll tell you what that story is. So don't be afraid. Don't be afraid of the audit. You do your work because when things go wrong, who is the first culprit? Who goes behind the bars? The auditor. He is the scapegoat. So do your job properly. Understand what you are doing it. 
spend adequate time, but don't get afraid of that I have to hurry, hurry up and uh, give the audit. And if I do it, I will get blacklisted. In fact, many, many years ago, when I, uh, this incident happened on 18th of April, the next year, uh, when the same audit was allotted to me, I went to the chief accounts executive of that bank who was handling this. And I said, I'm surprised that after what I did last year, you have still allotted the audit to me. He said, Mr. Sonawala, do you know one thing? I'm going to follow you. For each, in those years, there were five years audit. That was the first year audit. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to give you one of the best big branches that I can. And I'm going to call you up and ask you what are the queries that we have got in that branch. We need auditors like you who are, who are frank enough to tell us what are our difficulties. So don't worry about it. You will not be blacklisted. In fact, you will get, and since then, every year, since then, probably I think nine or 10 years, I, I, we have been in that bank with a break. We have got, instead of two branches, we have got three big branches. And every time till the, that officer retired from the bank, he used to call me up. Mr. Sonawala, tell me in which this branch, what did you, what new thing did you find, which should be a knowledge to the management? So don't worry, if you do an audit, fine. I mean, that is how the, you will be treated by the banks. Managers are aware that many of the auditors don't know the job. They are smart. They are there since 25, 30 years. So in one of the audits that I went, uh, the manager, lady manager called me up and she asked me certain questions. I answered the questions. Then I went for the audit. I did the audit. There is one story there also. At the end of the day, the ABM was suspended by virtue of my queries. And uh, after the audit is over, I have a habit after I give the report. So they are confirmed. They know that I've already given the report. I ask for the review from the branch manager. Please tell me how my audit was. Did you like it? What are the things that you did not like? That is a learning for myself so that next time I can improve. The lady manager then shared a story with me. I said, he said, Mr. Sonawala, when I heard you on the phone, I knew you are such an experienced audit, I can't fool you. So I was ready to give you all the records that I could give. But let me tell you the story before that. The previous year, there was somebody who came who did not knew the audit. And he sent his juniors. In two days time, I got the full audit completed. And he, she told me that today, you are completing the audit with 18 man days. So he said, when we come to know that the auditor does not know the audit, then we show him only those things that we want to show and not what the auditor can uh, detect. So the audit gets over. Now there are certain things in the bank audit that we really are afraid. One of the words is fallen. Fallen bills, fallen bills discounting, fallen guarantees, fallen LCs, everything that is fallen is fallen to us. We don't enter that department because we don't know what is fallen. I will, I will tell you how to verify that. Now, since it is fallen, we leave the last one hour of our audit to do that department. So we go to the department, we ask them, is everything okay? He'll say, yes, everything is okay. Has everything been balanced? Yes, everything is balanced. My dear, the computer balances everything. The, the staff don't balance it. Are there any problems? No, there are no problems. No officer is going to tell you if there are problems. They are not supposed to tell you what the problems are. The best manager, now of course it doesn't happen. The best manager is the one who ensures that you don't enter the branch and yet you sign the report. And do you know such audits have happened? And this has been shared by, to me by the branch manager themselves. That they come from Delhi, they come to Bombay, central auditors, they get into the branch, they ask the branch manager, are all papers ready? He said, yeah. Then they go for sightseeing. After one day, they come back, they sign the papers and they go away. That audit 
where the central auditors did the audit in two days, we took 25 man days. And we had a lot of stories and a lot of problems. So yes, there are friends who do that audit in that way, but please don't do it. It is, it is first of all, not good for you. Secondly, uh, if something goes wrong, then you will be held responsible for that. Some few more suggestions before you, we get to the audit. Everybody knows what is the word sanitizer, right? We have learned it in the last two years. There's one place in the bank when you go for audit, which is highly san sanitized. And that is the branch manager's cabin. So whenever you go for audit, offline audit, don't sit in a sanitized environment. And that is a branch manager's cabin. Why? What do I mean by sanitize? No employee will enter that cabin to make any complaints. No client, customer will have the guts to enter that cabin because he has been told by the, the pune, please don't enter, auditor is sitting inside. So it is sanitized. You will hear only what the branch manager wants to tell you, not what is the fact. So please don't sit in a sanitized environment. You will not get anything out of that branch manager or in that audit. Sit outside. So when you go, do your courtesies, say hi, hello to the branch manager. Tell him, I would like to sit outside where the staff are sitting. You, your juniors, everybody should be sitting outside. And when you sit outside, the first thing you have to tell the pune, I like the tea very much. I love tea. Even if you don't love tea, tell him I like it. And I would like to have tea every two hours. So the pune or the chaprasi will get a chance to meet you every two hours. And do you know the best information of the branch comes out from where? From that chaprasi. And you say, this is unethical. It's not unethical. You are sitting, somebody is giving the information. There are two ways you'll get information in the bank. You talk to the people, they will give you the information. And you talk to the papers, they will also give information. You said, what Mr. Sonal said, how can the papers talk? I will I'll tell you how the papers will talk. I will tell you exactly how the papers will talk. So sit outside, not in the cabin, talk to the people, let your juniors do their job, keep your eyes and ears open. There will be many hints and many things that you'll hear when you're sitting outside the branch. It doesn't mean there's a problem. You have to pick up the hints. Once you pick up the hint, then you have to get into those details to find out what exactly, and many of the stories that I'm going to tell you, and the frauds that I've detected, and the people I have got suspended in the bank has been by sitting outside. To be specific, there was one branch manager who got suspended on my report, and there was one assistant branch manager who got suspended on this because of wrong reporting that they were doing or because of wrong signing that they were doing. And all that information I got was sitting outside in the branch. Next is the query sheet. In Gujarati, I don't know if you understand, it is said, Lakhelu Vanchai. In English, it is said, whatever is written is read. Now we have a habit because most of us are from small firms. We are not from the big four. So we are not habituated to noting down. So when we find a query, we will go and convey to the branch manager. Most likely he will forget it conveniently. We will also forget it. By any chance, you happen to report that query in your report, the response from the branch manager will be, the, branch, the auditor never told me this. The auditor did not tell me this. That will be his response. So what is the solution? The solution is that everything that you do in the branch should be documented. But sir, how do you document it? Very simple. Take a piece of paper, note it down, take the branch manager's signature on that, Put a date, take this, everybody has this, take a photograph and your, fo your photocopy is done. Number it before you end your audit. Ask the branch manager, please give me reply in writing to each of the queries that I've raised. If he has an answer, he will write it down and give it to you. If he doesn't have an answer, there your query is. Now when you report, 
he cannot say that you did not raise it. So each and every small query that you raise, write it down on a simple piece of paper, put the name of your firm on the top, give it to, the, and you may give 100 queries to the branch manager every day. He's supposed to take it. Ideally, it would be if you can document everything of a whole same day, that would be better. But if you, if you have got different departments, give it to him, number it, take the photograph, and before you end the audit, ask him to give all the replies. That is how you will document that I have asked the question and the reply has not come back to me. Another thing, when you raise some major queries in the branch, before you inform anybody, send those papers for photocopy, major queries. Some client is there, some, I mean, some customer is there, and you find that some papers are not proper. I mean, there seems to be some big issue in that. The files have come to you. Send it out, get it photocopied. Worst case scenario, again, take use, make use of this and document it. Then you tell the branch manager, go and discuss with him. This is what I found out. And write it down and ask for the reply. In one of the cases where I got the branch manager suspended, I got this hint that there is a problem in the account from the credit officer with whom I was sitting out. And after the audit was over, I was walking with him to the railway station. That is the time he told me, he just told me, sir, just verify this account. Next day I came, took all the files, got it xeroxed. Then in the evening, I went to the branch manager. I said, I would like to verify this account. Yes, yes, yes. Tomorrow I'll give you the, I'll give you the details. Tomorrow never came because he said files are lost. I don't know where the files are, blah, 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 blah. Everything was there. That account went into a big NPA and the branch manager was suspended based on the documentation I could produce uh, about that account because there was N number of things that he had done in that account without the sanction of the regional or the office, and I did not get the file. But I got the file before I told the branch manager. So be careful if you are raising major queries with the branch manager, uh, get your papers photocopied uh, either outside or if worst case scenario, just take photographs. At least the main papers can be, you can take those papers. Then you have to give two reports, statutory audit report and long form audit report. When you raise any query, the branch manager will tell you, please add this into the long form audit report. It is a critical query. He said, no, no, you just put it there. What will you decide? What will you do? You will listen to the branch manager? No. Why? Long form audit report is a management report. It is read by the central strategy auditors after the audit is over, not before the audit is over. So if there's something critical and a provision has to be made, all high status is reported, it will get missed out by the central strategy auditors. So if there's anything critical, anything that is important and you need to report, add it in the main audit report, main audit report. And there'll be certain points that I'll tell you. To, and what is the harm in adding it to the main audit report? At the most, at the most, the central auditor will not report it in his main report. Central auditors are supposed to read all branch auditors reports before they sign it. And they write down in the report, report audited by me, and so many branches audited by other branches, which I have gone through before preparing this report. His main audit report says that. So by mandate, he is to read your report, your main audit report, before he signs the statutory audit report. So if there are major critical points, put it in the statu main statutory audit report branch. There is a place available where you can do it and not for the long form audit report. Yes, now when you're preparing your audit program, 
in that you can take the use of the long form audit report i think there is some discussion uh, one of the lectures probably will be there on long form audit report it's a managing but the questions that have been given especially the revised one that has come uh, there are so many questions which are there that if you prepare your audit program based on that report i think you are not going to miss out uh, you will be able to cover a major part of the audit so prepare your audit report based on that so that your juniors can cover up all those points and you can report it accordingly for the long form audit report whatever is critical can get into the main audit report also and one major change that has happened to those who have not done branch or bank audit in the last year is that till today till yesterday I mean, till last year we used to report that i have done the audit and we used to report the queries now one of the questions says please note down the name number of the customer of the client whose papers you have verified verified so you have to give a list of accounts that you have verified now you cannot escape and say general queries are there you will have to give the list that is why i say get go through the long form audit report format it requires you to give the names and details of the accounts that you have verified and when you come to verification of accounts there is a uh, guidelines that and which has been revised upwardly revised by the Reserve Bank of India in the new format it says that if any advance is more than 10 percent of the total outstanding or is 10 about 10 crores you have to mandatorily verify that account rest of the accounts you can do based on our test check that we are, are doing it but whichever accounts you are verifying you will need to note it down Before we go to the audit, let's look at the important laws that we need to know. First is the Banking Regulation Act. This is the mother act on which the bank audit is done. Reserve Bank is uh, the agency which monitors the bank audits. So you need to know the laws, the bank, very small act it is, but read it. Especially read section 20 of the Banking Regulation Act. What does it say? It says that banks cannot give loan against its own shares. Now, most of the banks are limited companies, public limited companies quoted on the share auction. So if you are looking at loans against shares, that bank cannot give loan against its own share. This is stated in the section 20. There's another thing that is stated in the Banking Regulation Act and in circulars of uh, Reserve Bank of India, and that is Loans are not allowed to be given to directors, their relatives, their firms, etc., etc. There is a big clause that is there which has been given. My question to you, are you go governed by the Banking Regulation Act, yes or no? Yes. Banking Regulation Act says that loans cannot be given to directors, their relatives, etc., etc. Do you know who are the directors of the bank? No. Do you know which loans are there? No. Do you know there are loans in your branch? No. You don't have the information. Even the branch manager doesn't have it. What do you do? Ignore this? You can't ignore it. You have to report in your main audit report that I don't have the information under Section 20 of the Banking Regulation Act. I'm supposed to report about loans to directors, their relatives, etc., etc. That information is not available at the branch. First, query that will go to the, your branch manager will be please give me details of loans given to directors this, this is in this branch either he will say there is no such loan if he says no then you report there is no loan if he says he doesn't know then report that in your main audit report that i have asked for this information it is not available i am not able to comply with this and then you note put another note i request the central auditors to so please verify this if you don't do it, none of the central auditors are doing But understand, there is a violation of the guidelines that, I mean, the law that has been given to you, that is the Banking Regulation Act. So make your report complete. And please add this point. This is one of the points that you will, you will add there. Then you come to the Stamp Act. Now, Stamp Act is a state act and also a central act. If you are auditing a branch in Bangalore, the Karnatak Stamp Act will apply. Karnatak Stamp Act of 1957. If you get a branch of the same bank, 
in uh, say Tamil Nadu, then the Tamil Nadu, or uh, sorry, in Inakulam, the Kerala Stamp Act will apply. If you get the audit of the same branch in Maharashtra, the Maharashtra Stamp Act will apply. And there are three different acts. And if the act does not cover all the points that you are going to verify, for example, revenue stamps is not there in an, any of the state acts, then there is a master act, there is a central act, Indian Stamp Act, that applies. So knowledge of the state in which you have got the branch audit is important for you because the stamping of the documents will be done based on the branch that you are auditing in the state in which it is. So you need to know that. Limitation Act. How many of you know what is the Limitation Act? One. Two. How many of you have done bank audits? Don't be afraid. I'm not going to note down. I'm not going to give any points to you. There are chocolates here. No, I don't know, but I'm not going to give you any chocolates. We are all in the same league. I've also learned the hard way doing my audit. Do you know how I started doing audit many, many years back? I signed my articles. I was told that a bank audit is going on. The very first was an internal audit of a bank. I was told a bank audit is going on. Please go to that. So I know, knew the place. I went to that place. One colleague was sitting. I said, hello, good morning. I am so-and-so. I asked his name. I said, how, how old are you in this? He said, I've come three days before. So he said, who is uh, the senior here? The senior is, has gone on exam leave. He's appearing for his finals. So we too, with a, with a senior who's three years, three days old, older than me in the bank audit, in, in the audit, in the article field, and a, another senior who has gone for exam, we started the audit. Now from the office, those who are practicing or those who have been uh, uh, in audit field for last, you know, we did not use the pen, we used pencils. So from the office, I was given three pencils. Blue colored pencil, green colored pencil, red colored pencil, without being told what it means. I asked my senior, three days senior too, what does it mean? He said, I also don't know. I said, we don't want to waste time. First audit, I have to prove myself to my boss. So I sharpened all the three pencils. After that, I started ticking. Blue tick, over, green tick, over, red tick, over. Now sit and sharpen all the three pencils. We need, need not waste time. It only after the audit was over, much, much later, I realized what is the significance of the three, three pencils. So I started my audit in this way, with zero knowledge, not knowing what, a, what it is. But over the years, over the years, I have met the bankers, I have spoken to the bankers, I have made friends with the bankers, I have learned from them what bank audit is, and now I am going and raising queries to them also. So someone, one of them who had taught me in the branch, he said, you, I taught you everything and now you're asking me questions. I said, yeah, that is what audit is. So yes, nobody has learned it, but now that we have got so much documentation, so much papers available, so, so many speakers available to it, learn from that so that you can do a better audit as far as the audit is concerned. Coming back to the law of limitation, I also did not know what this law is unless I went and read the law. The law says that if the promissory note has been executed or the bill of exchange has been executed on a particular date, say 1st January 2015, the validity of that document is only for three years. So 1st January 2015, 16, 17, 18. On 1st January 2018, this document will not be valid will be barred by the law of limitation. And you cannot take it to the court of law saying that this document is there because the document is not valid. So then what happens? There is something that is called LAD, ADS or BCC. What is LAD? Letter of Acknowledgement of Debt and Securities, all an alternative Acknowledgement of Debt and Securities, all an alternative Balance Confirmation Certificate. These are three documents that you'll find in the banks ensure that this document is taken by the bank ideally every year or at least every two years because that is required to extend the life of the promissory note once that is done then the life starts the three-year counting starts from the date on which the lad or ads or bcc has been executed and then the life goes on 
Of course, uh, this was one of the clauses that the banks were using. Um, but now, uh, when you go to the courts, they, uh, they don't go so much on this technical. They ask a question to the borrower, have you borrowed yes or no? If he says yes, he said, then the, we consider the document as valid. So now, in nowadays, there are no such cases which are rejected by virtue of this. But in the olden days, this is what used to happen about it. But still, get your LAD, ADS, VCC in, in place so that the validity of the document is available. Next is annual closing guidance and the ICA accounting standards. Every bank publishes a booklet every year at the end of this, which you will get if you get the audit, which is called annual closing guidelines. And it will tell you how to close the accounts and what are the entries to be passed and what. Are the, so you are not to do it, you have to verify it. Now, in that guidelines, there are certain points which are contrary to our ICI guidelines. The question is, what do I do? Do I follow the annual closing guidelines or do I follow the accounting standards given by the ICI? My answer is, follow what the annual closing guidelines is telling you. But, in the statutory audit report, you put out the points saying that these, these points I have followed as per the annual closing guidelines, which are contrary to the ICI guidelines. Example. We follow mercantile system of accounting in the bank. Everybody agrees, right? The guidelines will say safe deposit wall rent has to be accounted on cash basis. The major income which is not accounted in the books of accounts is interest on NPA accounts. It is accounted on cash basis. Does it follow the, the guidelines? No, it doesn't follow the guidelines of ICI accounting standards change it. You are going to follow what the bank does. But you are going to report that these are the points. And nowadays, in the audit report itself, many of the central statute auditors that will send you the draft report, they will mention all these points. There are provisions for salary, there are provisions for bonus, there is provision for many, many other provisions that are there which, are, which are not made in these accounts. And all those, ideally, if you want to your report, your report is a standalone report. I repeat the word stand alone report. That means for the branch, whatever you are reporting has, everything has to be reported in that report. The fact that you don't cover it and nobody tells you is a different point. Legally, you have to cover everything. So your report should cover up all these, all these points and follow the annual closing guidelines and, but report it. Now, why should I follow the annual closing guidelines? Because before you have started the audit, the branch, the bank has already consolidated the accounts. And you are not, not allowed to make any changes as far as the accounts are concerned. Everything that you want to change, you have to give it in the MOC. Even if there is a nil MOC, you have to give a report that the MOC is nil. So otherwise, thousands of branches are there. How are they going to make all the changes? So the law is no changes to be made based on the papers that have been given to you for audit. All changes have to be made in the MOC. All reporting has to be done in either the main audit report or the long form audit report. So that those are certain things that the bank has to follow. So annual closing guidelines you will follow, but you will report things which are not in line with the accounting standards or the guidelines that are there. Master circulars. Master circular, I, I'm sure you have done the audit, so you know master circulars are circulars which are issued by the Reserve Bank of India, consolidating all the guidelines that are there on that topic up to a particular date. Majority of the uh, master circulars were issued on 1st July 2015. After that, master circulars have, hardly any master circulars have been issued. If you go to the website, www.rbi.org.in, you will find, and click on master circulars, you'll get all the details of the master circulars which are issued. From that day, 2016, they have started issuing what is called master directions. Master directions, unlike master circulars, are a dynamic document in the sense that if a master circular is changed or something is being added, in the master circular, a new master circular is issued. But if a change is made in the 
master direction, then they will issue master direction dated 2016, updated on so and so date. So you know that this is what was the original one. This is what has been also. It is the dynamic document that is there. So nowadays, all the master circulars are being issued as master directions. Read that. Go to the website. Open the part which is called 2122 financial year. All the circulars that have been issued will be there. If you go to that booklet that I uh, said, institute booklet, in that all the details of all those circulars are uh, are given. And you can do it and there's still time available. The bank audit will start on 1st of April or 2nd of April or 3rd of April. You still have time of 10 days. Please go through all that so that when you go to the branch, you are well prepared to do the audit. Then you have got a computerized system. If there is a new branch that has been audited, you are given for audit, you need to understand the computer system. There are about three or four packages major packages the most used one is the finical one uh, which you know need to know how it operates but you say i don't know how to operate it so what do you do don't worry there are people who are supposed to operate it you have to just ask them the question all the papers that you need for analysis in your bank audit are available in any of these packages you can take it from me 100 percent available is it made available to you? No. When you ask for it, they'll say, this is not available. Then what do you do? Very simple. Tell them, give me the telephone number of the computer department. Call up the person there. I want this. Give me the command. And first and follow what I have told you before. Put it down in writing. I need this to the branch manager. He dare not tell you it is not available because it is available in the computer. So you need not know the computer to take out the statements from the bank. Ask him if he doesn't give it, report. Very simple. I have not verified this. You have not to break your head over that. So, but it is available. So whichever system of computer is there, don't worry about it. You'll get your details which you require for, and you need not sit and do any calculations. The finical and all of the packages are so sophisticated that everything that you need to report in your LFAR or your main audit report, the statements are available in the computer. From the computer package, whichever package it is, it will be available. This is the master circular on non-funded. I'm going to start with non-funded. This is one of the areas that we don't understand. And since we don't understand, we don't audit it. And since we don't audit it, and you say, oh, no money has gone in, uh, from this. This is only a promise. Why should I audit it? You need to audit it because a lot of frauds take place in this. So we will start with non-funded advances. This is a circular. There are three different banks are famous for using different, different nomenclatures. And that is why we get confused. This type of documentary evidence and this guarantee and that and guarantee and LC and uh, bill, uh, uh, discounting and bill uh, uh, co-acceptance, et cetera, et cetera. I will explain to you in very simple language, all non-funded advances are just a promise. No money is given. They are all promises. A promise made by the bank to somebody that if my customer to whom I have issued a letter fails, then I will give the money on his behalf. The moment that happens, then it becomes a funded advance. Before that, it is a non-funded advance. So there are three types of advances, guarantees, LC, and co-acceptance. We'll go through each one of them. All three are guarantees, but given different names because of different nomenclatures. It is shown as contingent liability in the, in the accounts that you will certify. It will not be up anywhere. Details has also to be given in the notes to accounts. You may not give it, but uh, the central auditors will, will give it. In your bank branch statement, you will get all these three non-funded advances as a asset and as a liability figure. 
So what is the, and they pass that entry. What is the liability figure? The liability figure is the promise that the banker has made to the third party. Okay, so he has issued a promise. So it comes as a liability. For all the three advances or promises made, the bank will take from the customer on whose behalf it is issued a what is called counter guarantee. So counter guarantee is what bank has got. So it comes on the asset side. So in the bank balance sheet, you will get it on the liability side, which is what the bank has given to the third party. And you'll get the figure, same figure on the asset side, which is a counter guarantee that the bank has taken from you. In the final balance sheet, finalized by the central auditors, this figure will not be there. It will go into the contingent liabilities and it will go into the notes to accounts. Look at any of the accounts, but for, for consolidation purpose, this is how it is reported. First guidelines from Reserve Bank. Non-funded advances or promises have not to be given to anybody who is not a regular customer of the bank. Any of the guarantees. Why? Very simple. This is just a promise. You don't take any securities. But suppose if the promise gets converted into a funded advance, what is the bank going to do? If it is a third party and outside or just a bill discounting or I mean, uh, just a guarantee is given or an LC is open. So the bank says, give it to your regular customers. And in the circular, they have given limits on which it has to be given. Read the circular. I'm not going to go to all the details. Why the regular customers? Because regular customers has got a cash credit or dis of OD facility or term loan. And in that securities have been taken. So by any chance, if this promise gets converted into a funded advance, the bank has got something to fall back upon and that is the, the securities taken for the funded advances. And that is why the bank, the Reserve Bank says that non-customers, non-regular customers of the bank should not be given any of the non-funded facilities. The maximum that can be given for the guarantees is for 10 years. There can be different, different guarantees. They will keep margins. If the guarantee gets invoked, it will get converted from the non-funded advance to the funded advance. Okay. Now let me explain the guarantee. There are three parties. I'm not sure whether those online will be able to see my hand because I can't see it here. They will be able to see my hands. Okay. I will use my hands. Right hand, left hand. And there are four parties. Party, the banker, the party in front and the banker of this. In guarantee, there are three parties. Example, suppose LNT gets a contract to build a metro in Bangalore. So there is LNT, there is LNT's banker, and there is the metro company. The metro company tells LNT that you will, I will give you the contract, I will give you an advance also, but I'm not sure whether you will execute it or not. So I need a, a third party to guarantee that if you fail, I will get my money back or somebody will give me a compensation. So the LNT goes to his banker saying that I'm getting this contract of Metro. Please give a guarantee on my behalf to the Metro company. So this banker of LNT will give a guarantee to the Metro company. This is called a guarantee. Now this banker will take another guarantee from the LNT, which is called a counter guarantee. Okay. If LNT fails to execute this contract, this Metro company will invoke the guarantee. It means this banker will have to pay that money. Once the banker pays the money, this non-funded advance will become a funded advance. The day it becomes a funded advance, it is due and overdue. Now I'm, I'm jumping into the IRAC norms. It will become due and it will become due if overdue if in 90 days this LNT does not clear this funded advance, the whole account of LNT will become NPA. Okay, that is the norm for 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 an NPA classification of non-funded advance becoming being invoked and becoming a funded advance. 
if everything goes fine the guarantee is not invoked and it is take, it taken back there are two types of guarantees which are there financial guarantee and performance guarantee generally reserve bank does not encourage bank to give performance guarantees because the banks are not capable enough to judge whether the performance has been done or not so they says please restrict yourself to financial guarantees in certain cases they may give but by and large bank the circular says please restrict yourself to financial guarantees only now we go to the next letter of credit there are four parties involved now the seller sorry the seller the seller's banker the buy the buyer and the buyer's banker now there are four parties instead of three now there are four parties okay the seller wants to sell some goods to the buyer but he is not sure whether the buyer will make pay him the money so what the what the seller tells the buyer that please go to your banker buyer's banker and tell him to issue me a letter a guarantee which in business terminology is called lc letter of credit certifying the credit of the buyer so the seller tells the buyer please go to your banker and obtain a letter which is called letter of credit so that i will supply the goods the letter of credit says that if this party party fails then the buy the sell buyer's banker will pay the money to the seller that is what the letter of guarantee says once this is done the seller will sell the goods send the goods to the buyer and he will send the documents to his banker this banker will pass on the document to the buyer's banker the buyer's banker on the will uh, will tell him to make the payments uh, on that lc goods have been gone have gone the bills are going on and as long as as long as there is no default in the buyer making the payments the lc will continue if the buyer fails then this fellow will in will devolve the lc it is called devolve the word is different but it is the same thing so when it devolves lc this by banker will send the papers to this banker and this banker has to make the payment on behalf of the buyer to the seller's banker and to the seller that is lc one thing i forgot to tell you in guarantees it is inland guarantee and foreign guarantee if both the parties are in india it is inland guarantee if one of the parties is outside say if the contract of ln it is not lnt but it is some party from us it becomes a foreign guarantee similarly in lc if both the parties are in india it is inland guarantee if one of the parties is outside india the goods are coming from outside so the seller is outside india coming from china this becomes a foreign lc that is the difference between inland and foreign and of course uh, rate of exchange and the money coming in time all those foreign uh, guidelines are there but basic structure is one and the same so this is the lc part of it if it fails it is called devolvement of lc now the third one co acceptance again the same four parties seller buyer seller's banker buyer's banker the seller has sold the goods to a buyer the buyer but he will not send the documents all of it to him the seller will say i don't know whether you will make the payment or not so he sends the papers the bills and the railway receipts or the transport receipts to his banker his banker will pass it on to the banker of the buyer the buyer's banker will pass on the goods to the papers to the buyer the buyer will first sign on the bill yes i have received the goods and i will make the payment but this seller says i am not satisfied with that i want somebody else also to guarantee it so the buyer has accepted it he now wants a second one to guarantee that is called co-acceptance and that co-acceptance will be done by whom the buyer's banker once this is done these papers will go from year to year 
and it will stay with the seller's banker on if by any chance if by any chance this buyer fails to make the payment then this banker of the buyer will have to make good the payment to the seller's banker and to the seller that is called co-acceptance so these are three types of guarantees one is called guarantee one is called lc lc is normally used in foreign businesses international businesses or co-acceptance all three of them are the same all three of them are basically guarantees all three of them are non-funded all three of them can be invoked or devolved and when it is invoked or it is devolved it becomes a funded advance and that is why the reserve bank has said that all these three advances which are non-funded should not be given to anybody who is not a regular banker regularly banking with the with that bank clear this is now non-funded now we'll come to the funded one Funded one is the one where actual money is given by the bank to the borrower. We are all used to that verification. Uh, it is very, it is simpler for it because we understand that language, loans, cash credits, bill purchase, bill discounting, etc. Of course, bills are certain things that we uh, don't understand, but compared to non-funded, we are much more comfortable as far as the funded advance is concerned. There is a new guidelines given by the Reserve Bank of India, which says that all advances above five crores, their details should be given to something what is called Central Repository of Information on Large Credits. Each and every bank is supposed to give details of that to this repository where the details are available. For accounts which are low, less than five crore rupees, there is a, another central fraud registry which is uh, being held, but that covers only the accounts which are in which frauds have been committed. So if you want to, if you have got accounts which are more than five crore rupees, and if you want to know these details, ask the bank to get you the report from uh, those because this is now mandatorily told by Reserve Bank of India. Then the advances based on, as I said, if both the parties are in India, it is inland funding. If one of the parties is outside export or import, then it is foreign uh, advance that is there. So based on geography, the, the type of the advance changes. As I said earlier, only the foreign exchange rules will change. Rest of the things will remain the one and the same. Then we have got advances based on security. Secured is one where some tangible security has been taken by the bank. Stock, book debts are also tangible. Some government guarantees, those are all tangible. But if no tangible guarantee has been, no tangible security has been taken, then it becomes a unsecured advance given against only personal surety. Then comes based on sector. Priority sector, we are all aware of it. Government has mandated that 40% of the advances should go to the priority sector. What is priority sector? That is defined in the circular. And rest of the loans are all non-priority sector. Now, all these classifications that I listed just now in the last 5-10 minutes, when you look at the bank's loan statement, advances statement coming from the branch, which you have to audit, all these classifications are given there. So when you are verifying it, it this is not all. Each one has to go either is priority or non-priority. It is secured or it is unsecured. Whatever it is, that chart that comes from the bank has to be verified. And that is the chart when you start verifying the loans. You have to start taking that chart and ensure that all the details are there. And how to verify that chart? That will go a little further also uh, in that. Now we come to other terminologies which are used in the bank. Demand loan, term loan. Banks are famous to issue various terminologies. I am not taking up those terminologies. I am explaining to you in the basic concept of that. Demand loan is a loan which has to be repaid in installments. It is not a demand loan. 
it can be recalled on demand. Term loan is a loan which can be recalled on demand. So now what is the difference? Demand loan can be, has to be paid in installments and term loan is something that can't be recalled on demand. So I have this segregated. They have segregated for some uh, comfort level. Anything that is up to 36 months is called a demand loan given against stock, book debts, or movable securities, that is called demand loan. Anything that is a long-term one, housing loan, they are all called term loans. The basic structure and rules for the demand and the term loan is one and the same. So don't get confused about demand loan or it is a term loan or everything is, uh, is generally the same. Some terms and conditions do change in that. Dhananjay just said, there is one advance which is given and is never recalled in the lifetime of the borrower, subject to following certain norms or certain fulfilling certain terms and conditions. And these are the two advances. Once you get it, you have never to repay it in your lifetime, provided you renew it, you pay the interest, etc., etc., and your stock stream and everything is there. That is what is cash credit and overdraft. Again, the question is why two terminologies? I don't know, don't ask me. But I tell you what it means as far as the bank is concerned. Advances against stock and book debts are called cash credits. Advances against any other security, fixed deposit, insurance policies, etc., etc., are all called overdraft. Rules are the same for them. Both of them are not being recalled. If some additional advance is given, as far as the cash credit is concerned, temporary over limited is called TOL, over and above the sanction limit. Now, as far as that TOL is within the overall security value, it is considered as a secured advance. So if the cash credit is secured, the TOL also becomes a secured advance. It doesn't become unsecured. Coming to overdraft, Again, there is a secured TOL that will come till the value of the security. There is another advance that is given, which is given normally in the current accounts, and that is called TOD, temporary overdraft. So temporary over limit is separate, temporary overdraft is separate. Temporary overdraft is unsecured, normally given against personal guarantee, normally to be cleared when the 15 days or 20 days of a month. Frequent TOD is not to be given, otherwise it works adversely against the person to whom it is being given, but it is unsecured. There's another unsecured advance, which is credit card advances, credit card loans that are given. That is also unsecured because there is no security as far as the credit card is concerned. They are all unsecured advances. Bill purchase, bill discounting. This is one of the items that we again are afraid to verify. Why are you afraid? Because we don't understand. When we don't understand, we are afraid to verify that. Again, I'll explain the same thing by the four parties. Sorry. Seller, seller's banker, buyer, buyer's banker. Four parties. Seller, buyer, they are bankers. The seller wants to sell the goods to the buyer. The seller says, okay, I'm sending the goods. The seller sends the goods to the buyer. But he will not send the documents to the buyer. What he will do is, he will take the bill, the ala receipt or the uh, railway receipt or the lorry receipt and take all the papers and give it to his banker. This banker, the seller's banker, will pass on the documents to the buyer's banker. The buyer's banker will call the buyer, says your goods have already been dispatched. They are in transit to your the town where you are staying. But before you take the documents from me, you have to make the payment to me. That is a condition that has been laid down by the seller and the seller's banker. So he shows a document to the buyer. The buyer has to make the payment to the buyer's banker on those documents and then clear the documents. Once that is done, this money will go from here to the seller's banker and it will clear, it will uh, finally go to the seller. 
This is called bill purchase. Bill purchase is legally and technically a secured advance. I repeat the word legally and technically a secured advance. I'll explain the terminology when I come to bill discounting. Why it is secured? Because the goods are in the custody of the seller or his agent. This, this is a seller, this is his agent, this is also his agent. So before the buyer gets the goods, it is in the custody of the seller. So it is a secured advance that is. What is the advance that goes? That when this bill has gone from the seller to the seller's banker, the seller's banker will give him some advance against that bill. Because an advance is to be given from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, it takes 30 days maximum for the goods to reach. So this advance should get cleared in how many days maximum? Bill purchase should get cleared in 30 days time because he cannot clear the goods unless he makes a payment. So all bill purchase advances which are given in the branch should get cleared within 30 days unless the terms and conditions are something different but by and large it should not be. Now let's take these four parties and go to bill discounting. Same thing seller buyer, seller's banker, buyer's banker. The seller sends the goods to the buyer. He gives the documents to the, not to the seller's banker, he sends the documents directly to the, to the, sorry, he sends the documents to the seller's banker, the seller's banker will give the document to the buyer's banker, the buyer's banker will call the buyer and get the documents executed. The buyer will accept that he has received the goods. He will not make the payment. He will accept on it. And on the bill, he'll write that I will make the payment in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. That is called bill discounting. He accepts it. The buyer will sign that and he will pass on the papers to the buyer's banker. The buyer's banker will pass on the papers to the seller's banker. The seller's banker will give some advance against this bill for 30 days, 60 days, 90 days to the seller. At the end of 30, 60, 90 days, the seller's banker will again pass on the document to the buyer's banker. The buyer's banker will ask the buyer to make the payment on that bill. The buyer's will make the payment to the buyer's banker. The buyer's banker will pass on the money to the seller's banker. The seller's banker will now clear the advance, whatever he has given with the after the margin and credit the balance amount to the seller's account. This is called bill discounting. If something goes wrong, okay, I'll give you a story. I think a story would be very good. So there are, there's a seller, there's a buyer. There's a seller's banker, there's a buyer's banker. The seller starts sending goods to the buyer. There's no san sanction facility. So he sends individual bills to the, to the bankers. The first bill gets cleared. The buyer makes the payment. Then there's a second bill. Again, that gets cleared. There's a third bill that gets cleared. There's a fourth bill that also gets cleared. The seller's banker is now very, very confident on the seller. So the seller will say, now please give me a sanction limit. See, so many bills have been cleared out. So he will get a limit sanction, one crore limit. So slowly, slowly, this seller will go on selling the goods to the buyer. And slowly, slowly, he will start utilizing the limits of one crore. One fine day it happens that the buyer has got, I mean, the seller has got one crore of bills discounted with his banker. On the due date, the seller's banker will send all the bills of 1 crore rupees to the buyer's banker. The buyer's banker will call up the buyer. That is a normal system. He calls up the buyer on the phone. Phone switched off. He calls up the buyer on the mobile. Mobile not working. The buyer's banker is not worried about it. He takes his scooter or he sends his spoon to the buyer's place. When he goes there, he realizes that the office has been closed. He inquires with the neighbors. He said, this office was on rent. We don't know where this person has gone. The buyer, the buyer's banker does not get perturbed. He takes all the bills that comes back, sends it back to the seller's banker saying that 
the buyer has vanished. Now this man, the seller's banker manager, will get perturbed, will get panicked. He will immediately call up the seller. Phone not working. Phone out of order. He will take his vehicle and his office and rush to the office. What will he find? The seller has taken the office on rent. The seller has gone away. The neighbors don't know where it is. What has happened? One crow money down the drain. Where was the issue? The issue was that the seller was selling the goods to his own party who was the buyer. Both were known to each other. This whole transaction was done with the intention to defraud the bank. This is not called bill discounting. This is called accommodation bills. Okay. That is why Reserve Bank says that when bill discounting facility is given, it should not be stand alone facility. There has to be a corresponding collateral security definitely taken, especially for bill discounting. For bill purchase, you have to take it, but for bill discounting, this has to be it has to be done. Otherwise, because once the bills bounce, what is the seller's banker going to do? There is no security. Now I come to the point. Legally, these bills are unsecured, but technically they are secured. Bill purchase, what did I tell you? It is legally and technically secured because the goods are in the custody of the seller's agents. In this, the goods are already with the buyer. So they are not in the custody of the seller or the seller's banker. So legally, this is unsecured. But Reserve Bank of India has said for the purpose of classification, it is considered, it has to be considered as a secured advance on the same lines as stock and book debts are considered as a secured advance. Does the bank have the stock and the book debts in its custody? No, it is lying with whom? With the person to whom the advance has been given and yet it is considered as secured. On the same lines, on the same analogy, bill discounting, though it is unsecured, it is to be considered as a secured advance as far as the classification is concerned. Another point which I just told you, which I am repeating and that is that Accommodation bills are rampant and that is why when facilities are sanctioned, at that point of time, you have to ensure that the, buy, the bills, the parties whose bills are discounted are the ones whose names are approved by the sanctioning authority when the, when the facility is sanctioned. So the banker cannot discount bills of Tom, Dick and Harry. He has to sanction the bills of the parties whose names are already pre-approved by the sanctioning authority. So when they are pre-approving the name of the sanctioning uh, of the bills, whose bills to be discounted, they take care to see that they are not related parties. They, they, these are genuine deals, deals and collateral security is taken. That is what the sanctioning authority takes care of it. And that is why they say that ad hoc bill sanctioning or ad hoc bill discounting should be avoided as far as the banks are as far as the branch managers are concerned, because lots of chances are there that that bill can become a NPA bill or it can be a accommodation bill. Okay, now we move to the next thing, verification of documents. I have already told you about 10% selection any advance that is more than 10 percent has to be compulsory selected or it is more than 10 crore rupees whichever is less we have to select it uh, all accounts which are restructured all accounts which are showing some problems you need to so there is no specified percentage of accounts that you need to verify you may have to verify 10 percent 25 percent 50 percent if the branch has got problems you probably need to go to verify even 100% of the accounts, depending on the branch and depending on the NPA which are, which are there. And that is why if you, if you have read the guidelines of the Reserve Bank of India, it says that a bank as a whole has to give for audit to the auditors at least branches which cover 90% of the advances of the bank. 90%, 9-0. Why do they say? Because if that is not covered, small, small branches can be left out and 
As a result, NPS can increase because if verification is not done, then the chances of NPA or loans not going properly can all happen. In LFAR, there's one paragraph, 1-5, Roman 1-5, which relates to advances. Read that whole paragraph, based on which I told you, make your audit program. That whole paragraph has been revised last year. So those since March 21, so those who have not done the audit in March 21, uh, for you, this will be a new paragraph. It has been thoroughly revised. And one of the major points I told you is that now the name of the account which you have verified, the limit that we have verified has to be noted there. In the past, we should just skip it, verify not, no, no queries found, that will not do. Even if you have no queries, you have to mention the name of the party and the amount that you have verified so that you now are specifically responsible for that audit that you have done. So if anything goes wrong in future or if any Fraud takes place, one of the parties whom the bank can catch hold of is the auditors. Because now we have stated in your report that I verified this account, I found everything fine. So you can put it in the report without verifying at your own peril. If something goes wrong, you will be, and that is why this paragraph has been introduced in one, one of the paragraphs that is there. Reporting, I've already told you, two reports. Okay, so I need not go. Your query sheet can be drafted based on this. That can be done. This is the master circular issued on uh, statute and other restrictions, loans and advances. If you remember this circular 23rd July was referred to by uh, Dhananjay Gokhale also. This is a new circular that has come. First July is the old one which is already there. This is a letter that has been issued giving some clarifications. Okay, next. Credit appraisal and sanction. Normally we as statutory auditors, we don't go into the details of the sanction letter. We don't have the time for that. That doesn't mean we are absolved from that, but generally we start off believing what is stated in the sanction letter has been properly appraised, credit appraisal has been done. So we start with a sanction letter. When you start with a sanction letter, we have to see all the terms and conditions have been complied or not. Um, there's not much time I can go into the stories of uh, sanction letters, but yes, even in sanction letter, there have been frauds that, that have been there. So right at that point of time, sanctioning and disbursement, there can be fraud. I'll give you a very simple example. One of the audits. It was prescribed that a housing uh, advance against housing has to be given. And when the housing advance is given in those days, a letter had to be obtained from the housing society saying that we have noted our lien in the account. Now, there are rules and regulations framed of how this letter should be sent to the housing society. It, should, it cannot be sent by uh, only the staff of the bank can take it and take it to the credit society, I mean to the housing society. He has to stand there and get it signed and he has to get the letter back. If the banker, to save his time, hands over the letter to the borrower himself, the borrower doesn't go to the housing society. Where does he go? He goes to the Xerox wala and tells the Xerox wala, please, please prepare a letterhead of the bank. And this is a fact story I'm telling you, no, not made up story. Please prepare a letterhead of the housing society. The NOC is written on that. Rubber stamps are available. He signs it and the paper is given to this. When the loan went bad and the bank went there to the housing society, the society said, this is not our letter. We have never issued this letter. Somebody has defrauded you. So even that one letter, which is called from, if the rules are not followed, that is where the things go wrong. In, in a sanction letter, there are things which are now very useful to us. GST, GST returns, audit statements already there. GST returns now are something that can be correlated with the sanction and the turnovers that are there. Stamping, I've already told you, charge noting uh, need to be done insurance. 
This is a mandate given to you by the Reserve Bank of India. Any transaction, and this is an old uh, mandate, susceptible to fraudulent trans transaction to be directly reported to RBI by the auditors. Directly reported. So if you find something, don't wait to tell the management or to the central auditors. You can directly send the letters to them. RBI has issued letter on frauds, classification and reporting. And in that letter, they have issued 43 early warning signals. Please, if you don't need any paper, please read this two page paper in this circular. All those 42 points given by the Reserve Bank of India are indicators that there may be a fraud. If you, if you encounter any of these points, and I try to tally my stories with these, with these points, and I realize that all the points that Reserve Bank had given, majority of the points are tallying with my stories. So I have actually vetted those 43 early signals which have been given by Reserve Bank of India, and I think they are really, really very useful. Please read them, and please be sure whether you are looking into those things or not. I'm going to spend the next 15, 20 minutes on this and any time extension that the chairman gives me in this. Talk to the papers. When you go to buy a car, a second hand car, what is the first thing that you look into? What is the most important thing in a car? Is it in running condition or not? The body may be fantastic, but it's not running, then what is the use of it? Like that. For the loan account to be running condition, you have to look into its papers. You have to look into its operations. And how will you look at the operations? Go and sit on the computer and start looking at the transactions that are there. And when you sit on the computer, please don't use the manager's password. If something goes wrong, they will blame you that you have made the changes. Ask for auditor's password. How will you ask? Write down. If they don't give you the password, then use somebody else's password, but note it down that you have used some, somebody else's password. And if possible, let that person sit next to you. Because if something goes wrong in that account, somebody makes some changes, then they will say the auditor was sitting here and he did it, so we don't know what it is. So. These are all facts that I, that I have faced while doing audits. So I'm warning you, please be careful about using pa the password of the manager. Now, look, look at the statements. You have got uh, and call for all the stock statements from March 21 to February 22. Keep those stock statements, book desk with you. Look at the operations. Total up all that 12 month statement. If you find big debits, or big credits in the account, your bell should start ringing. Why are the abnormal debits? So you know the total turnover. If some, if the total turnover is say one crore rupees, and if there's one entry of 50 lakh rupees, you know this is not a business transaction. There must be something else. There must be something else in that. So big debits, big credits, no debits, no credits, all those are indicators. Total transactions, you will get it on the computer. The computer will tell you what is the total of the whole year. Take that total and look at last year's turnover or the state stock statement that he has given and how much turnover is coming into that. So you do on comparing. I'm not telling you these are fraud points. I'm telling you these are diagnoses. Just as a doctor, when you go to the doctor and say that my stomach is paining, he'll not start with your stomach. He'll start with your pulse. He'll start to ask you some questions. He's diagnosing. And then finally, he'll come to your stomach and then he'll tell you, okay, this is the pain that is there. Same way, when you're looking at an account, you, can, you cannot look at all the accounts in this way. When you're looking at big accounts, this is the system that you need to follow. That look at indicators in that account. And indicators can come to you from account operation, from audited statement, from stock statement, and from physical inspection reports. These are the papers that will speak to you. I said the papers will speak to you. Look at the accounts. In one of the accounts, it's a long story, I'll cut it short. In one of the accounts, 
we found that there was an entry called stock in transit. We went for stock audit. Stock in transit, 2 crore rupees. Total limit, 5 crore rupees. Stock in transit is a genuine entry. What is stock in transit? When the stock has been sent to somebody else for processing, it is a genuine entry. Or, sorry, stock in transit means the stock has left from the place from where you have bought it and it has still not reached your go down. Like the yarn uh, which is being sent by Recron company from Guwahati, Assam to say Wapi for processing, yarn processing. It's a genuine entry. But what are the terms and conditions? Condition is that before it leaves, it has been paid by the buyer. On 30th of the last month, I mean last date of the month is, is in transit and most important condition is that after the 30th in the next month, that much stock in transit should have been received in your stock register or in your excise register. In this one case which we saw there, the stock in transit was 2 crore rupees running from 14 months. Same amount was there. Every month. I mean, every next month, the stock received actually was only 50 lakh rupees. Indication was sure that entry was a bogus entry showing that it is stock in transit. It was no stock in transit. Now, we did not tell the, in the go down when we went there that this is what, we came and look at the accounts. So when he came to the accounts, we realized that this man had uh, retired two of his partners and he had paid 2 crore rupees to the partners. Now 2 crore rupees paid to the partners for retiring them has to be brought in by the partners who are continuing partners. This man did not bring in any money. So what did he do? He used up the CC amount. Who gave him the idea? You can understand who gave him the idea. Okay. And that man who gave him the idea said bankers don't understand this. Auditors will not look into it. It was only the st statement that we said and for 14 months this thing continued and within those 14 months two times the bankers had done the audit, had done a stock inspection and they had not questioned it. So just looking at the stock statement, stock in transit a question, you will realize that this is a fraud. This is a fraud because he did not bring in the money and he has been using this amount for that purpose account continuously overdrawn. These are the things that we have already heard. Stock statements, 31st March 2021 stock statement, call it, look at it and compare it with the audit statements of accounts as on 31st March. What will you find? What will you find? It will tally. In my audit career, I have never found even one statement which tallies. Don't panic. It is not a fraud market value, cost value, some obsolete stock. So if there's a difference of 10, 20 percent, 25 percent, okay, that is acceptable because he has taken a limit which is higher than to the from the bankers, but there is still a margin available. But if there's a difference of 80 percent, then what happens? Then your bell should start ringing. That he is taking advance from the bank against which stocks and book debts are not available. So when you look at the stock statements, these are the things that you can uh, identify. Now look at the book debt statements, you'll find that only debts of up to 90 days are allowed. When you have 12 month statement along with you, the name of the parties are given. Just go on comparing. Mr. I.B. Sonawala, outstanding due in April 10 lakh rupees, May 10 lakhs, June 10 lakhs, July 10 lakhs. What does that indicate? First of all, this debt is more than 91 days. Second is that this might be a bogus one, just it is given in the statement. Third is, even if it is genuine, more than 90 days uh, amount has been given. So when you look at the statement and you look at the names that have been given, it will give you an indication. Again, I repeat the word indication that things are not proper as far as that is done. Now there is something called loan against LC. We just dealt with it. Now when loan against LC is given, that stock against which LC has been taken, that is already a stock which has been financed by the bank. Now, if that stock is again included in the stock statement, it is double financing by the bank. So you have to look into if has the party got LC facility, has it taken any LC 
facility and LC bill discounting against that, that stock is already paid for by the bank. It cannot be double included into this. Another strategy of the borrowers. Stock is available, stock statement is available in the accounts. All stocks are sent, 10 lakh rupees stock, 10 lakh rupees in the audited statements. Sundry debtors, 12 lakh rupees. Now what happens? What is the condition of sanctioning the loans? It, has, it is against paid stocks, paid stocks or book debts which are genuinely outstanding for less than 90 days. What has the borrower done? He has already taken credit of 12 lakh rupees from the market and he's also taking 10 lakh rupees from you. So he's double financing uh, the, uh, in this. So when you look at that statement and you find the Sunday in the audited accounts, if you find the Sunday creditors are much higher than that, minus it out. And then uh, the banker will say, no, no, there's no such condition. Whether the condition is there or not there, I mean, that is you're giving loan against paid stock. You cannot give loan against unpaid stock. So if sundry creditors are standing, uh, those loans cannot be given. Book debt statement, sorry, stock statement. Another story. A reputed paper manufacturer of Mumbai. We went for stock audit, 10 crore limit. He has got one sub uh, statement in the, in the stock, in the stock statement, sent, stock sent to processor. What does it mean? Stock sent to processor. It is something that the stock has been sent for some processing, genuine entry it is. Because all stocks are not lying there. Some stock, when you like shoes, if they are sent for making the sole or fix, fixing something, those are stock that has been sent on for processing. Genuine entry. Now, while reading that stock in process, the name of the person, by and large, those people who do the processing, you may not be know their name, but we were doing the audit of this paper man who was sanctioned loan from, say, a uh, bank a now in the stock to processors it was written bank a two crore rupees what was written bank a stock sent to processors in the list of that there was bank a two crore rupees so at the go down we did not get a reply came to the paper met the director what did he what explanation he gave he said you see when i got a facility of 10 crore rupees the bank asked me for a margin money. The margin was given in the form of a fixed deposit. Now, where do I show it in the stock statement? So I have put it in stock given to the processors and he has added two crore rupees. So nothing to laugh. These are all fact stories are there. But as I said, how can you add it? Bank has taken it as a margin from you. You have added it in the stock statement, again, taken a finance against it. So what is the, where is the uh, margin going? I never knew this can, cannot be done. Nobody pointed out. Again, in that case, for two years, the banks had done the audit, the banks had seen the statements, but nothing had happened, but nobody, nobody reads it. Nobody reads it. Stock statement again, stock statement has come. Yes, sign it, finish it off. Chairman, I've exhausted my time. Two months have gone up. You can give me as much grace as you can. I've got the stories. Okay, all the 10, 10 minutes will be stories, okay? Another story, doing an audit of a bank, of a branch which was on the first floor and incidentally, the borrower was on the sixth floor of the same premises. The stock was, the loan was again stock of spare parts. How small are spare parts you can know? So small, small parts are there. Spare parts, machinery spare parts. Four crore stock statement, what should be the size of the statement in terms of size? This much? Or this much at least? Right? Because stock, uh, spare parts of machinery are very, very small ones. We got a stock statement of only four lines. One, two, three, four, four lines. 
Now, this was an indication, but I cannot say this is a fraud. As I told you, when you get, as a doctor, when you get an indication, it is only diagnosis. It is still not a fraud. You need to investigate further to ensure that whether it is genuine or it is a fraud. So we saw that statement. Then what we did was, we know that there is some problem. So we went into what are the stock verifications done. So we found that just 15 days back, one of the staff of the bank had verified the February statement. We were auditing April, March statement had still not come. He had verified it. So we took the verification report. He had just signed on it. Then we took the insurance uh, policy in which we found that the stock is at six go downs. We look at the stock statements. It says that the stock are at uh, about seven or eight go downs. Fine. We took this information and then we called that person who had done the in inspection. And whenever you call anybody for inauguration, this questioning, ensure that the branch manager stands there. You first do your homework, then call the party for the questioning and let the branch manager stand. So he's a witness to what he was. So the first question is, you went for this talk audit? Yes, yes, sir. 15 days back, I went for Very good. This stock statement is only four lines. Now, when you verify the stock statement, you need an inventory. Now, please show me the inventory when you verified it. And I knew that on the sixth floor, there was already a, one of the go downs of this party. No answer. How did you verify it? No, no, no. I just went. How did you verify four crore stock? Okay, tell me. How many go downs did you visit? I visited two go downs. In the stock statement, there were about seven or eight go downs. In the insurance policy, there were six go downs. Another lie. How many total go downs are there? I asked him. He had not read the stock statement. He had not read the insurance uh, statement. So he, he said, no, only three are there. I said, there, in the stock statement, six are noted. In the insurance policy, so many are noted. After these questionings, he finally agreed that he went up on the sixth floor, just had a look at it, had a cup of tea. I don't know what else he had. He signed on the stock statement and he came back. Okay, so there is a there is an indication, then there is diagnosis, then there is interrogation like a doctor, and there is finally the account was classified as a NPA account. I did not take it to a fraud account. Uh, I did not. I have not verified the go down, but I knew what it was an NPA account. The same thing happened in another branch. The same lady who told us that the previous auditor was sent back in two days. There were three go-downs, I mean three borrowers, all dealing with stainless steel items, all go-down addresses at the same place. All three are, I was told, related party, and all three are having their stock at the same area. I mean, same stock, same area, same place. So we went through the stock statements. Again, no details given. So we called the person, it was the ABM who had gone for the verification. Question number one, and we made the branch manager stand there. Question number one, how many parties are there? He said three parties are there. Are the stocks segregated? No, not segregated. If they are not segregated, how did you certify the three statements that this stock is there? No, sir, I just saw it. I said, that is what you're supposed to do. How did you do the valuation? After all those questioning, the surprising thing that we came out with was that he not, not, did not even visit the go down. Sitting in the office, he was an ABM. Sitting in the office, he just signed it, stock verified. The branch manager heard it. We sent a note to the management and that ABM was suspended. So the point is that Look at the stock statements, look at the book debt statements, look at the operations, find indicators where you find that things are abnormal, get details into it, get deeper into it. Once you get deeper into it, you will realize that either the account is good or the account is probably not good. I will take up a last story. 
when you go to the bank, ask for the total ad uh, advances, how much it is, and find out who is the biggest borrower. Be assured that if the biggest borrower is a major consumer of loans in that branch, he is dominating the branch. And if he's dominating the branch, then a lot of uh, not so good things may be happening there. Okay. So we went to this branch in again in Bombay. Out of 50 crore advance, 40 crores was already given to one party, which was already an NP account. So my job was easy. But I said, let me look into the 40 crore account because it was restructured on the last day, 31st March. Talking to the branch manager, we realized that the restructuring was ordered on 31st of March at 3 p.m. And the branch managers and the people of the regional office continued doing the restructuring till way into the early morning of the next day. Now, when such things come up, the account was already classified as NPA with a 40% provision. When this thing happened, I said, let me check out whether the restructuring has been properly done. Bank staff, officers have also to save their own skin. So what they do is when they prepare this report, they will put down all the points which are negative in their report. But to, and finally, they will say the account is standard. So what happens is they have already reported these are the things. Who takes the decision? The top management, regional office, national, central office, they take the decision. So they have already, so we took those papers and we realized that all the negative points of this account were noted down. The borrower had committed fraud, given bogus checks, and yet the account was on that day, if the if the restructuring was not done, the account would have gone into 100% uh, D3 facility. It was already D2. We went through all the details which are there. We realized that all compliances have not been done. But if restructuring is taken into consideration, it is only a 40%. It cannot be downgraded. So what do we do? Documented everything that was there in that account. All the notes that were given by all the officers for restructuring were noted down. All the points of restructuring which were not complied with were also noted down. And finally, we put our remark. Considering all the points that are noted on the tab, it is our considered opinion that though this account is NPA with a 40% provision, in our opinion, this account should be provided with 50% more that is 60% provision, considering all these things. There were phone calls from the RO, Mr. Sonawala, uh, please don't give this report, this, 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 blah, 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 everything, everything. I said, nothing doing. Let the central auditor reject it. Central auditor happened to be a person who was in our group, who writes, we, we write the book, no? uh, auditor advances, he was one of this. I had already called him up. I said, Sandeep, I'm sending you a report. Do it independently and let me know whether what I've said. Sandeep told me, Mr. Sonawala, when your report came up for additional 20% provision, not a single officer objected to it. And he said, you know why they did not object? Because they knew that the restructuring has been wrongly done. It is only to save that account that they had done it. They had committed all the blunders that you have highlighted. And so nobody stopped it and understand 40 crore accounts, 20% provision is equal to 8 crore, much more than the profit of the branch. So if you do your job diligently, if you sit in the branch properly, if you look at the papers properly, if you do the diagnosis, this, then I think you can, and you document your things properly in the papers. I don't think there should be any problem, even if there are problem accounts in it. And you can complete the audit. I only hope that you don't get branches uh, like this. You get branches where there are no problems. Yes, we did have branches where there were no problems. We had, did get branches who are still, branch managers are still my friends after so many years. They just still call me up. 
they still ask me, Mr. Sonawala, where you're giving a lecture? I would like to listen to a lecture. So they are friends also. And there are persons who have uh, been suspended because of the report that we are given. Finally, I would like to tell you, I have already done this, renewal, reschedulement, physical inspection. Go to the branch yourself or send a senior. Do the audit diligently. Don't go to the branch for one day or half a day. Do justice to it. Do all the notings. As I said, whatever is written is what is recognized. And then be happy. You will not be disqualified. You will get your audit for four years. Um, maybe your report will be appreciated as my report was done many, many years back. And if your report is appreciated, that branch, that bank will give you bigger audits. Even if nothing happens, at least you are satisfied that as a chartered accountant, as an auditor, you have done justice to the fees that you are getting from there. A last question. I'm not going to ask for a reply. How much, how many days does the audit take? Four days, five days, six days, seven days? Yes? Six, seven, eight days, right? What is the minimum fees of a branch? Pardon? Branch 30, 40, 50. Check your own list of clients and find out how many clients will give you that sort of fees for working for six, five, six, seven days, 10 days. So the bank is paying you very well. Do justice to the job that you are doing. Thank you very much. What an excellent session by CA Ismail B. Sonawala, sir. A round of applause for the excellent session. Every new example, sir, was quoting, we heard branch manager or assistant branch manager was suspended based on our reports, etc. That doesn't mean that bank branch audit involves these things, but my dear professional colleagues, to safeguard our profession and do justice to the work what we have got allotted, we should not hesitate to call a spade a spade. That comes only by experience. Thank you so much, sir, for your examples, stories rather. Thank you. I thank on behalf of Bangalore branch of SIRCF ICAI and members present here and virtually. That was a knowledge enriching session. Uh, Ismail B. Sonawala, sir, thank you once again. As a token of gratitude and respect, can I request MC member C.A. Rejo to present a memento to our speaker. With this second technical session comes to an end. Uh, let's break for lunch and assemble sharp at 2.30 p.m.